and the, his followers, the fallen angels, the demons. I want us to review just a few points that we made uh, briefly last Sunday and uh, notice some of the things that Satan does, uh, especially to you and I who are Christians. And of course, Satan works primarily, I think, on Christians. He tempts the believers. He tempts them to fall into sin, tempts them because uh, if we lose our testimony, certainly the lost people are not nearly as likely to listen to what we have to say when we tell them about Christ. But let's notice some scriptures about that. In Matthew chapter 4, we notice that Satan does tempt. And of course, here is an illustration of how that he tempted our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And I want to show you how that Christ answered his temptation in Matthew's Gospel chapter 4, a very familiar portion of Scripture. Uh, Christ was led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Of course, God does not tempt, but the Holy Spirit led the Lord out into the wilderness, and then Satan, of course, did the tempting. And we find that when Christ was at his weakest physic physically, he had uh, fasted 40 days and 40 nights, then Satan came, and it even calls him the tempter in verse 3, and uh, he began to ask questions, and uh, each one of these questions had an if uh, with it. If thou be the Son of God. Uh, the first one was, and there were four different times that Satan came and tempted the Lord, and each time the Lord answered with Scripture. And I think that's very, uh, very interesting, uh, and certainly we cannot improve on uh, God's plan. The more we know of the Word of God, the more we hide away the Word of God in our hearts, the less likely we are to sin against God, as the psalmist said. And each time, the Lord Jesus answered with Scripture. And finally, in verse 11, it says, The devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Now these are, of course, God's angels, the ones who had not fallen, came and ministered to the Lord Jesus. So there's no doubt about it. Beginning with uh, Adam and Eve... Satan has been tempting the human race ever since. In Genesis chapter 3, we find out that Satan came in the form of a serpent and beguiled Eve. And again, use the little word if. In tempting her, she took of the forbidden fruit and then gave it to Adam and the human race fell into sin. Ever since then, that's what Satan is doing. He is the tempter. He tempts God's people. Let us not forget that. But let us not go the other extreme and uh, say like a fellow used to say, the devil made me do it. <laughs> because in reality, the devil can't make us sin. He can't make us. Now, he can tempt us. But we cannot really blame the devil. It's when we're led of our own lust that, we're, that we fall into sin, according to the epistle of James. And all of us are tempted, including the Lord Jesus. But he didn't fall into sin. And uh, you and I, uh, we can, through the Word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the blood of Christ, we can have a victorious life and meet Satan and defeat him through Christ. And then we notice he traps men, secondly. And uh, in 2 Timothy 2.26, you can write that reference down, it mentions in 2 Timothy 2.26, the snare of the devil. And the devil loves to trap people, including young people through drugs, alcohol, tobacco, uh, rock and roll, rock music, they call it now, uh, different things, uh, pornography. I mean, we can go on and on, and, uh, and uh, we can even say some things that may not look evil on the surface. Religion. Satan has even used religion to trap people and to cause them to remain lost and on the, on the road to hell. But uh, Satan would love to trap you and I who are Christians. The snare of the devil. And it uses the term in Ephesians 6 and verse 11, the wiles of the devil. Certainly, he's not out to play games. This is warfare. The battle that's going on between Satan and God, between Satan and God's people. This is warfare. This is not a game. It's literal warfare. And then we find, thirdly, he hinders the work of God. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church in Thessalonica, used the term in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 18, Satan hindered 
us. How many times has Satan hindered the men of God and the Sunday school teachers? Those who know the Lord because that's who Paul was writing to. He said, Satan hindered us. Now, another thing. He constantly causes problems for the servant of God. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you would look over there with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 7, and down through verse number 9, the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, he said, Unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Now go back to verse 7 and see what this problem was. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. You see how that Satan causes problems for the servant of God. I would say anyone that's really doing something for God, Satan is going to do all he can to trip them up. I mean, if Satan can cause the man of God, the preacher, to fall into sin, think of how many people are looking to him for leadership. I mean, he's to be an ensample to the flock, the Word of God says. So if the man of God falls into sin, a lot of the other folks are looking to him for leadership. How disillusioned they become. You see, there's a lot of responsibility, a lot of pressure put on the man of God because people are looking to him and that's part of the territory. And the Sunday school teacher, the deacon, those who are in leadership that are set examples, how important it is that we lead people properly and realize that Satan will do everything he can to trip us up. In 1 John 2, verses 15 and 17, we're going to look at some uh, scriptures here that really set down some principles that are that have always been and always will be, I, I, I suppose, except, of course, uh, uh, what I'm referring to as long as the sin is in the world. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned up till the time Christ takes us home to glory, we see these areas. And in 1 John 2 and verse 15, writing to new believers, he said, Love not the world neither the things that are in the world. Now we notice the word world here, we don't see the word Satan, but who is the God of the world? Who is the God of this world? Satan. Alright? So I think we can say that Satan has something to do with this. Don't you think so? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... Now notice, number one, the lust of the flesh... Number two, the lust of the eyes. And number three, the pride of life. Those are the three areas that Satan tempts people. Uh, we saw it with, uh, in, in Matthew 4 with the Lord Jesus. We see it in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve. And we see it today that Satan, or Satan uh, tempts through the lust of the flesh. He says, you'll be, uh, look at this and, and take of it. So the lust of the eyes, he uses that, look at it, then take of it. There's the lust of the flesh, the actual taking of it. You become as gods, knowing good and evil, he told uh, Satan. There's the pride of life, you see. Uh, and Lucifer, middle letter is I. Pride, middle letter is I. Sin, middle letter is I. That's what gets us into trouble, isn't it? I, 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 pride. And uh, Satan knows that. And so he comes and he tempts the pride of Life. Uh, we see that in the philosophy of the day and age. Do whatever you feel like. Whatever turns you on. I mean, as long as you're not hurting someone else, go ahead and do it. It's all right. Uh, the world philosophy, the humanistic philosophy, is, uh, goes right along with this idea. The pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so we want to do the will of God, don't we? And, uh, of course, that begins in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish.
perish but have everlasting life. God's will is that you receive His Son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. No doubt about that. God's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 tells us. So Satan and his angels. Now let's look at the nucleus of this truth. Our enemy, Satan, is a very real being. Those, uh, I'm sure our missionaries could tell us some real uh, battles that they've had on the foreign mission fields with Satan. But did you know that Satan isn't confined to the foreign mission field? He, through his followers, is all over the world. He's the prince and the power of the air. As we said last Sunday, he's not omnipresent like God is, but yet Satan has so many followers that uh, he has an influence all over the world. There's no doubt about that. And he's gaining more and more an influence right here in our own country. And uh, I'm going to show you one of the ways that he's doing that in just a few minutes. But now, whether one believes that the demons and the fallen angels are the same thing or not, I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference. We know one thing, that the followers of Satan are unclean, are seductive, and evil. Once in a while I like to share things with you that... Uh, that might be controversial in some people's minds, but I think once in a while we need to have our minds stimulated to do some real studying on our own and get some convictions on our own from the Word of God. These followers of Satan are very uh, elusive and are real as real as Satan himself is real. Now, there are two extremes in this area in the mind. And God wants to control our mind. And uh, primarily He controls our mind through the Word of God. But Satan also wants to control our mind. And there are two extremes. One extreme is the sound mind. In Philippians 2 and verse 5 it says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. But on the other extreme is the reprobate mind that Romans chapter 1 talks about. And how that God gave them up to a reprobate mind. It, it just uh, impresses me the long-suffering of God and the grace of God and the patience of God. But even His patience is going to run its course one day and His judgment is going to come upon the earth and the Bible says He's going to laugh at those who cry out for forgiveness and, and so on in, in Proverbs chapter 1. There's going to be a day that God will laugh at their calamity and will mock. You see, the reprobate mind, doing those things that are not convenient, uh, that's the other extreme. Now as we look at this great truth of Satan and his angels, we notice two references we, we uh, shared with you last week. Jude verse number 6 was one of them. Jude verse number 6, where it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now there's one reference to the fallen angels, those who followed Lucifer. His name was Lucifer to start with, the, uh, as one of the three named angels of God. And uh, when he was cast down, of course, he became Satan. He became the devil. Uh, and along followed him, we believe, about a third of the angels followed him. The angels of God. And they fell with Lucifer. And according to the Scripture, it says here that they, ha they are chained up. It says, He hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 is another reference that deals with this uh, same uh, subject where it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now, I think for someone to say that some of the angels are chained, the fallen angels are chained and some aren't, is to read something into the Scripture in my own personal opinion. It seems to me that all of them are chained up. That's just the way the Scripture reads to me. And yet we know that there are demons. We know that. 
Uh, the Lord Jesus dealt with them on numerous occasions in the Gospels, with the maniac of Gadara in Mark chapter 5, and some other places where there was demons, followers of Satan. Now where did they come from? Are they the same as the fallen angels? Well, my own personal opinion is that they aren't, but like I say, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference what you call them. They're, they're real, they're evil, they're, they're, they're horrible, they're our enemies, they're of the devil completely. And we are waging a war against Satan and his followers. Now there are those who, of course, believe in the gap theory, uh, that there is a space of time between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. As a matter of fact, years ago, that was pretty prominent. Most people, many of the uh, Bible-believing students uh, uh, subscribe to that theory. Well, since then, there have been other uh, thoughts along that line. But let's say if the, th the gap theory was real, let's say that there is some merit to that. Evidently, there was some type of life before Adam and Eve because the Lord God told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. And, and uh, if you look up that word replenish, it means that there was some kind of life there before them. When Lucifer was cast down, those who subscribe to the gap theory believe that when, when Lucifer was cast down, that that form of life, they did not have souls like man did. The only one that's ever had a soul in God's creation is man, Adam and Eve. God crea created him and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. But if there was some type of life before that, that could have been those spirits, because animals have spirits. When they die, their spirit goes into the ground. But that could be some type of a creation that when they fell with Lucifer, their spirits could be those who have become demons. Now that's a theory. That's just a thought. Uh, I really, I don't think it's worth a whole lot to fight about. You see, things that are worth to fight about are the fundamentals of the faith, like the blood atonement, things like that. But it's kind of an interesting study. Anything that's in the Word of God, I believe, is, is, is interesting to study, to see what God's Word has to teach us. But that's a possibility of where the demons came from. Now let's go over to Ephesians chapter 6. And I think that today, this will be our key scripture. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6. Let's look there from verse 11 through verse number 17. It says, first of all in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Put it all on. That, and here's the reason, that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the methods, the wiles of the devil. We're not ignorant of his devices, the scripture says. And so we need to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan is referred to as the God of this world. We're fighting against the wiles of the devil, spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. He, he mentions that again from verse 11 and again in verse 13, the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, what does it say? After you've done everything you can do, after you've used every ounce of energy and everything you can possibly do and you're about to pass out. <laughs> he says to stand therefore. Just keep on standing. Is there ever an excuse for God's child to throw in the towel? I've always been amused at so many folks who come and say, well, I'm going to take a year off. I'm just going to rest for a while. And uh, I've, always, I've noticed those people. It seems like that year drags out to two years and then three years and then four years and five years. Uh, I don't think there's a time for the person who's really bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, who belongs to Jesus Christ, to take time off from serving the Lord. 
And that's why we need to be careful when God does call us into a service to be sure that it's God's calling us and that we're not doing it out of human emotion or some other reason. Be sure that it's God that's calling us to start with, and if He does call, His calls are without repentance. Stick with it. Stay in it. Keep doing it for the Lord. He said, after you've done all to stand, stand therefore, keep on standing, having your loins girt about with truth. Now notice the armor. Your loins girt about with truth, having on then the breastplate of righteousness. And then he said to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then above all, this is very important. He said, above all, taking the shield of faith. We can't defeat Satan without faith. The shield of faith. Wherefore ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now if somebody's shooting darts at you, are they playing games? Not on your life. Trying to kill you. So you need to have a shield of faith out here in front. And you need to have a breastplate of righteousness. You need to have that uh, helmet. As he talks about in verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Now there's an offensive weapon. The sword of the Spirit. We're going to go after Him too. You cannot stand still for God. You either have to go forward or you're going to go backwards. Someone says, I don't like to fight. Well, if you're going to serve God, you'll have to learn to fight. This is not a game. We're in this thing to go after our enemy. We have to be on the offense, not on the defense. Nowhere in the Word of God did it tell us to be on the defense. It tells us to be on the offense. The church is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're to be going out there giving the gospel out. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it, it says in Matthew's gospel, the last few verses of, the, of his gospel. That means the, the battle is going on at the gates of hell, not at the gates of the church. That's where church is getting into trouble when we think we're going to just kind of be to ourselves and, and uh, so on. Uh, what we need to do is be on the offense, going after the lost. Using that sword of the Spirit on the offense. Sword of the Spirit, it says, which is the Word of God. Hebrews 4 and verse 12 elaborates on that, how that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged Sword, either way it cuts. Either way. Now, we have the whole armor of God. Do you find anything there to protect your back? <laughs> Not a thing. If you turn and run, the devil has a clear shot, doesn't he? But if we stand up in the power of God and we use the Word of God like Jesus did there in the wilderness and we have the whole armor of God, then truly we have the victory over Satan and over his followers. And as we shared with you last week, James 4 and verse 7, it says, Submitting yourself therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, either the Word of God is true or it isn't. And I choose to believe it's true, don't you? Submit yourself therefore to God. Put yourself in the Lord's care. Turn it all over to God. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Let Him be your life. Let Him control your life. And then it says, if you resist the devil, He'll flee from you. We're not to give place to the devil. We're to, flee, we're to resist him, and then he does the fleeing. We don't do the fleeing, he does when we're doing things according to the Word of God. Now, not only does Satan have the demons to follow and work for him, but also there are many people of the human race that follow him. Let's look over at John's Gospel, chapter 8. I was looked at the uh, little insert into the Los Angeles Times this morning, and it talked about the human animal. And when I read that, it kind of makes me want to <laughs> act like an animal in a way, I guess. But I, I don't like to be called an animal. Do you? According to the Word of God, we're not animals. We're not human animals. Uh, 
We're not of the animal kingdom. God created us and gave us a soul. We're created. He created the animals too, but we're not of the animal kingdom. God gave us dominion over the animals. And of course, those who believe in the uh, theistic uh, theory of evolution, they, they call us animals. Well, I don't believe in evolution. I believe that God created us. Just like the Bible says, He created us. And in John chapter 8 and verse 44, it says, Ye are of your father the devil. Now it's interesting, Christ was speaking here not to uh, uh, prostitutes and bartenders and, and uh, folks in the mafia, uh, anyone like that. He was speaking to religious people here. And he said, Ye are of your father the devil. The Pharisees, the religious crowd were the worst enemies that Christ had when he was on earth. And uh, it says, You are of your father the devil. Now that's pretty strong language. Somebody says, I like a little nice sermon where you don't hurt anybody's feelings. You just kind of, you know, give us something positive and kind of make us feel good. So when we leave church, we feel good. Well, that's, boy, people wouldn't like the way Jesus preached, would they? Or the Apostle Paul. Or Jeremiah. I mean, the men of God, they, they came for one thing, and that was to li- deliver the message that God had. When Jesus spoke here, <laughs> I'll tell you what, probably made some people mad. I would think so. I mean, if he told someone that they were of their father the devil, that probably made them angry, I would think. And it goes on, he said, The lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. In other words, Christ was saying they were of their father the devil who's a murderer and a liar. Usually children are a little bit like their parents. So evidently he was insinuating that that's what they were. He was telling them that they were murderers and liars. Of course, ultimately that's exactly what they were when they put Christ on the cross and said, crucify him, crucify him. They were committing the sin of murder right there. They lied. They did everything they could when he was before uh, Pilate's uh, crooked courtroom. You know, They tried everything they could. But now here's some language. He said, you're of your father the devil. Now, really, every one of us is either a child of Satan or a child of God. We don't have a middle ground to stand. We don't have anybody else. Either it's Satan or God. And I don't say this to to offend anybody. This is just the truth. One thing I found, if I teach the Word of God, if somebody gets mad, they'll just have to get mad at God because I didn't write it. I'm just an errand boy, just a messenger boy. And uh, as long as I preach and teach the Word, then I'm on safe ground. And so if somebody gets mad, they just have to get mad at God. Sam Jones, the great Methodist evangelist of years ago, he said when he started out preaching, he was worried that he'd make somebody angry. Then he said after he preached a few years, he was concerned if somebody didn't get angry. (laughs) He found out that preaching and teaching the Word of God, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and there are those who are going to get angry anytime you give out the Word of God. But really, either you are a child of God or a child of Satan. Now, and keep in mind, these people were religious, but religion never saved anybody. Only Christ can save. He said in His own words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now that includes us, doesn't it? No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus is the way. The only way. Not the best way. Not a better way. Not a preferential way or anything like that. He is the only way. And someone would say, well, that's kind of narrow, isn't it? Aren't you glad there is a way? (laughs) There didn't have to be a way at all, did there? But there is a way, and that's through Jesus Christ. And instead of saying, well, isn't that kind of narrow? What you ought to be doing is saying, well, thank God there is a way, and I want to get there. I want to get there through the Lord Jesus. And, uh, you have your father the devil, he said. In uh, 2 Corinthians 11, and of course, review is one of the 
best methods of teaching, repetition and review, are two ways that we teach. And over in 2 Corinthians 11, we read this last week, but let's look at it again, verses 13 through 15. The apostle said, For such are false apostles. Now here are religious ministers, if you please. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now just because somebody says Jesus and speaks of Jesus Christ, whose end shall be according to their works. We have to be careful. We need to check out, folks, on the virgin birth and on the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, on these fundamentals of the Word of God to see if they're really of God. And uh, you can write down 1 John 4. That's a good place to test them out. 1 John 4 in the first few verses. Now let's just look at a, little bit, a little bit at the power of the demons. And let me say this, too, in, in passing, that I believe any time the Bible speaks about a subject, we need to teach it, we need to preach it, we need to believe it. But God help us not to get sidetracked. I remember a certain person who I uh, had a, lot of great, a great deal of respect for, who was a tremendous man of God, but then he all of a sudden seemed, that's all he preached about was Satan. I mean, every message was about Satan and the demons. Every message. I'm not exaggerating this. That was his whole ministry. And in a matter of time, Satan got the best of him and he, and he lost his ministry. And I personally believe this, that if all we do is get off on Satan, then we're, we're giving him all the attention rather than God. And I believe that we need to be very careful that we always lift up Jesus Christ and glorify Jesus Christ. That's our message as Christians. But when it does speak about our enemy Satan, we certainly need to take a strong stand in opposition to him. Anything that he's for, we're against. He's our enemy. But we just need to line up with God and that will take care of itself, I think. Now, one Satan, but many demons. The word Satan is a Hebrew word for enemy or adversary. He is Satan, our enemy. The word devil is a Greek word for slanderer or accuser. He accuses the brethren night and day. He did that with Job and he does it to us. He transforms himself into an angel of light, goes right into the presence of God and accuses us. Satan is our enemy. He's our accuser. He's our slanderer. Now the demons are known as several things. And I'll give you the references and, and what they're known as. Familiar spirits in Leviticus 19.31. Familiar spirits. Leviticus 19.31. Unclean spirits. In Mark 1.23-27. Unclean spirits. And then they're known as evil spirits. In Luke 7, 21, evil spirits. And then seducing spirits. Seduce, that has to do with temptation. Seducing spirits. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. They're known as foul spirits in Mark 9, 25. Foul spirits, Mark 9, 25. And we find that their activities denote their power. It says in Ephesians 6 and verse 12 that we read a few minutes ago, in high places. Satan's the prince and the power of the air. We're, we're fighting a war of spiritual, they're, they're, uh, they're of spiritual darkness. You see, Satan's kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. God's kingdom is the kingdom of light. You and I who have been saved, we're of that kingdom, the kingdom of light. But now, the demons desire to possess bodies of individuals. Over in Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 5, we notice here one of the, I think one of the best illustrations of demon possession in the Word of God. Someone asked me the other day, do you believe that this is still, uh, that, that there is still demon possession today? And I said, yes, I do believe there is still demon possession. Uh, I've talked to uh, some folks who work in mental institutions. And I've had them say, some of those folks, uh, 
that are extremely men mentally ill, they have almost a superhuman power, energy, or strength that no one else has. Uh, and I think some of the mental illness could well be explained by demon possession. I don't believe all of it is, but some of it. I believe demons, of course, if this theory, going back to that theory I was mentioning a little while ago about uh, some kind of creation before Adam and Eve, the demons, they desire to embody a, or to dwell in some kind of a body, and they desire to possess a body, and we find that that's what happened in Mark chapter 5 when Jesus gave them leave of this man who was possessed of a legion. Uh, we find in verse 8, For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. This man couldn't be tied down with chains. It tells us before that in this chapter. He was a maniac. He was crazy. He was, a, he was naked. He, he scared everybody. I mean, uh, and, and the devils in verse 12 besought him, saying, Send us into the swine. They wanted to in, indwell a body, and so Christ gave them leave. They went into the swine, and the swine went into the water and were drowned. So these demons, you see, wanted to possess a body. Now, I don't know that we have the power. Mark chapter 16, it mentions right along with the tongues and all the other things of casting out the demons. And... Uh, I don't know that we have the power to cast them out. I believe God does through prayer. I believe God has that power, just like healing. I don't believe we have the power to heal somebody in ourselves as a faith healer, but I believe God has the power to heal. And thank God we've seen some folks heal recently through prayer, the anointing of oil. Uh, God has the power to heal. We don't, but God does. And I want to ask you, don't, aren't you thankful that we have an all-powerful God who's able to do all things? I, I don't think I'd... Well, I know I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that. God is able to watch after His own, meet their needs. And I just thank God for that. And I thank God we have a church that believes in a God who's able to reach down and uh, to the uttermost and bring people up and put their feet upon the rock, Christ Jesus. Thank God for that. What does Satan do? And through the demons, there are many things mentioned in the Bible. Sorcery. Witchcraft, astrology is mentioned in Daniel chapter 1. Did you know some folks, they put more stock in their horoscope than they do in the Word of God? Somebody says, I'm a Capricorn. Didn't think they looked like one, but <laughs> I'm a Capricorn. I'm an Aquarius. I'm a, and I, I look, I, I, listen, I'd rather go by the Word of God than by a horoscope, wouldn't you? I think we're asking for problems. And uh, uh, some of these things we need to be very careful of. The word witchcraft in Galatians 5.20 is from the word pharmakeo in the Greek language. Pharmakeo, and by the way, we get the word pharmacy from that in the English language. And uh, I'm going to give you this just thought uh, toward the end of this lesson that I believe the drug addiction has an awfully lot to do with demon possession and, and, or demon obsession, Satan's power, because when a person is on some kind of a drug, they've lost their ability to say no, they've given themselves over to where Satan can, can do what he wants to do. And I, in our nation... I remember when I was a young person, there was a, a, some documentaries on drug abuse, cocaine, heroin, and some of these things. But it's completely gone wild now. It's about to tear our country completely in two. All over, uh, murders and all kinds of terrible crime happening just because of all this drug addiction and this, these things that are going on in our culture today. And uh, if you read, read Revelation You'll find that word pharmakeo on a number of occasions, and, and I think this is uh, an indication, and I thank God for our president who uh, talked about this in the news conference the other day and wanting to declare war on drug addiction and doing everything he can, and I believe we ought to support him in that area, to do all we can 
against the drug peddlers who are ruining our, uh, many of our young people, our best young people, and so on. But did you know Bible believers have been saying this for many years? We need to be against drugs. And, and now we're finally waking up as a nation, I believe. There's another word having to do with Satan and his demons, and that's necromancy, which is communicating with the dead. Well, I believe we've covered this pretty well this morning. Uh, I want to share one last thought, and that is this, that one day, glory, Satan is going to be cast into the lake of fire and will not be troubled by him anymore. The Lord prepared hell for the devil and his angels. According to Matthew 25, 41, and in Revelation, the last part of chapter 20, it tells us how he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. There'll be no devil in heaven. There'll be no Satan in heaven to torture us or torment us anymore. And I'm grateful to God for that. And Revelation 12 and verse 11, it says they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Our energy, our recipe to overcome Satan is through the name of Jesus Christ and through the power of his blood. Satan hates the blood of Christ. But oh, how we need to preach the blood of Christ and lead people to Christ. Let's bow our hearts before God, please. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for each one who's come today. We ask God that the Holy Spirit might continue to take the Word and, and apply it to our hearts and lives, especially if there's one here today that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I pray that they might come to know Him today, even before they leave this building. Lord, I pray that we might see people come to know Christ. And we'll thank Thee for it. Now with our heads still bowed and eyes closed, there might be a man or a woman here this morning, anywhere in this auditorium that would say, Brother Shook, I'm thankful that you've given out the truth in this Sunday school lesson. And I do want to know that when I die, I'll go to heaven. I want to have complete peace in my heart that I'd go to heaven if I died right now. And I want you to remember me in prayer as you close this lesson this morning in our class. Would you slip your hand up real high? And say by that uplifted hand, pray for me, remember me in your prayer. We won't embarrass you, I promise you, but we'd like you to, uh, like to remember you in prayer if you'd like to be sure of your salvation. Would you slip your hand up anywhere in this building and say by that, pray for me, I'm not sure I'm saved. God bless you here, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Would you raise your hand and say, pray for me about this need? Precious Lord, we're thankful for this one. We pray, God, you'd meet their need today. Help us all who are Christians to truly live for Christ and to let you have your way in our lives. Bless in the after service in a mighty way. We'll thank thee for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said together, Amen. Thank you so much.